what is happening with our boys? Have you noticed that there is a national debate, international debate, in Australia, the United States, in Britain, all across Europe, what's happening with boys, with boys in school, are boys in trouble, what about the boys? Just a few of the covers of magazines and newspapers, it's been everywhere with my own contribution uh, on, uh, on the screen as well. It's everywhere we look. And if you look at some of the data, you would conclude that boys are, in fact, in some real trouble. The data tend to turn around three distinct areas. First, the numbers themselves. In Australia and the United States, 60% of all university students are female. Just the, just the numbers alone. Second, how about achievement? Across Australia and the United States, girls are getting higher grades they are getting, uh, they, they're getting more honors. The 75% in the United States, 75% of the number one graduate in high schools across the country is a girl. So, so are, boys, are boys doing worse? Um, and, and then it comes to behavior. In Australia, boys are three and a half times more likely to be suspended, five and a half times more likely to be expelled two and a half times more at risk for emotional immaturity, and two and a half times more likely... <laughs> you thought it would be higher. <laughs> and two and a half times more likely to complete suicide. So those are the three dimensions, and if you were to follow those, you might conclude that there are fewer and fewer boys, they're doing worse and worse, and they're getting far more behavioral problems. So how are we asked to think about this problem? Very frequently we're told, well, one problem could be not enough male teachers. The boys need more male role models, so we have to have more male teachers. Another one, another critique says, actually, it is the, it's, the, it's feminists' fault because they have completely changed the curriculum to make it more girl-friendly. So these little boys with testosterone surging through their limbs have to learn how to be quiet, sit still, raise their hands, and take naps. <laughs> or perhaps it is simply uh, that we are not paying sufficient attention to different learning styles between boys and girls. Perhaps it's that the boys and girls are so different that we have to modify our, our, our teaching arrangements. I think all of these ignore the most important element in, the, in what I think of as the boy crisis that we're talking about, which is the actual experience of boys. And, by the way, the actual experience of girls as well. So let me tell you a little bit about the way in which I think about this. First, let's just take the numbers and take that off the table. It's not that boys, that there are more and more girls and fewer and fewer boys. The truth is, more people are going to university than ever before. It is true that the rate of increase among girls is greater than the rate of increase among boys. But it is not at all the case that girls are sort of soaring and boys are kind of declining. So that's the first thing. But let's take a look at that achievement question. It is true that girls are catching up to boys in science and math that their mean scores on tests are relatively the same these days. Well, why would that be? Well, here's what we know. Girls tend to underestimate their abilities, and boys tend to overestimate their abilities. <laughs> so what that means is that in science and math classes, especially the higher level science and math classes, you have fewer girls who are really, really good. They bring those mean scores up but you have a lot of boys who have no business at all in those higher level math and science classes, <laughs> and they bring the mean scores down. That is why you have the parallel between, uh, in achievement. But more than that, let's take a look at the other side. Let's take a look at English and languages. Here, I think we bump squarely up into the ideologies of masculinity. A, a wonderful ethnography of high schools in, in, here in Australia by a, a, an education professor named Wayne Martino sat and, li and listened to boys and girls in high schools here in Australia talk about how they felt about English and, and languages. And the boys said things like, 
oh, I hate English. It's like there's no right or wrong answers. You have to say what you feel, and I hate that. So a girl sitting literally next to him in the school says, but that's what I like about English. You, there's no hard and fast right or wrong answers. You get to talk about what you're feeling. That's what I really like. So boys don't like English and language for the very reasons that girls say that they do. And so, so the other thing, so let's talk about some of these remedies then. We know that boys overestimate their abilities, girls underestimate them. So let's talk about some of these remedies. Well, more male teachers, it's okay, but to be honest, there is no empirical evidence whatsoever that sex of teacher by itself has an independent effect on learning outcomes. Yes, of course, um, th there are plenty of schools that, it turns out that what, you know what really matters? Student-teacher ratio, resources in the school. Independently, sex of teacher is way down on the list of, of having a real effect. But let's talk about some of those other reforms. The feminized curriculum, for example. Well, I've addressed that by talking about the ways in which boys and girls estimate their abilities. But then there's this idea that we're not adequately dealing with boys' and girls' different learning styles. And there's a movement in the States which actually is somewhat reproducing some of the traditions that you have here in Australia, which is single-sex schools, or even, in our case, single-sex classrooms in public schools. So when students go off to do math and science, they separate the boys and the girls. Now, I want you to think about this, and those of you who are parents, I want you to think about this as well, uh, about your own kids. Here is the kind of remedy that is being offered by, these, by this movement to bring, in, to bring our students into single-sex classes. So just read this with me for a moment. This is the National Association for Single-Sex Public Schools, the U.S. organization. Girls and boys differ fundamentally in the learning style they feel most comfortable with. Girls tend to look on the teacher as an ally. Given a little encouragement, they will welcome the teacher's help. A girl-friendly classroom is safe, comfortable, welcoming place. Forget hard plastic chairs. Put in a sofa and some comfortable bean bags. The teacher should never yell or shout at a girl. Avoid confrontation. Avoid the word why. Girls will naturally break up into groups of three and four to work on problems. Let them. Minimize assignments that require working alone. Now, I hope that every woman in this room is deeply insulted by this. <laughs> but what I also hope is that all the men are pretty insulted, too. The only way we could possibly learn is if we're in hard, plastic, uncomfortable chairs, <laughs> and the teachers are yelling at us, um, constantly saying, why, 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 and we can never work collect cooperatively. This is what I think is we're, we're being asked now to teach to stereotypes, not to our children. We know our children are as different as snowflakes. We cannot possibly teach to this kind of stereotype. So I think these are the, this is the kind of issue, and now I want to talk about what I have found. I've been working with, um, with, a, with some, some boys' schools here in Australia, and I've been doing some workshops with them. And here's basically the, 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 the basic conclusion that I've come to looking at the way boys approach their education across the United States and in Australia. And this is the key to what I want to tell you today. Boys regard academic disengagement as a sign of their masculinity. How little they care about school is a badge of honor among their, guy, their male friends. How, say it in another way. Academic engagement is really seen as kind of questionable. This is the key then, that boys have come to regard academic disengagement as a way to prove their masculinity. And I would ask the men in the room to think about, when, when did you learn this? Because we all got these kinds of messages. And what I've been doing in my work with these boys, and what I was gonna, I'd like to suggest for the, the men in the room as well to think about, is how we incorporated this. How did we learn this? This isn't natural to us. We're naturally, if you've ever watched a two or three year old there, we are naturally unbelievably curious. Somewhere along the way we lose that. And so the workshop I do, and this I'm gonna ask, ask the men in the room just to think about this for a minute, 
When you wake up in the morning, this is, a, this is what the kind of exercise I do with the, with the boys and, and with men uh, in lots of different countries. When you wake up in the morning, men, and you look in the mirror, and you say to yourself, you're a good man. At your funeral, you want it to be said of you, he was a good man. What does that mean to us? What does it mean to be a good man? This is what men say. They say, honor, integrity, do the right thing. Stand up for the little guy, be responsible, be a good provider, a good protector, sacrifice, put, your, put others before yourself. That's what we think it means to be a good man. And when, and then I say, where'd you learn that? And they say, well, it's everywhere. It, it's, in, it, it's, it's Homeric, it's Shakespearean, it's the Judeo-Christian heritage. And that's true. Those ideas about what it means to be a good man are pretty much universal across our countries. So then I say, okay, that's what it means to be a good man. Now you tell me if those are the same phrases, words, and, and, and ideas that come up when I say, man up, be a real man. And then the, the boys say, oh, no, 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 that's completely different. That's be strong, be tough, never show your feelings, play through pain, suck it up. The, the number one thing that boys say in, in, in the United States, never cry. It is be hyper-competitive, win at all costs, get rich, get laid. That's what it means to be a real man. So I asked the boys, where did you learn that? And they say, in order, father, coach, my male friends, my older brother. Women, mothers, girlfriends, grandmothers started about number seven on that list. We learn what it means to be a real man from other men, from our mates. So I think what I want us to begin to tell our own sons is not the story of how awesome we are, but rather the, the times, and every man in this room has had this, I know it, every man in this room has had the experience at some point in your life when you have been asked to betray your own ethics, your own values of what it means to be a good man in order to prove you were a real man to other guys. We all have that. That's the stories I think we have to tell our own children. I would love to tell my 17-year-old son how awesome I am. But what I really need to tell him is the times I did the wrong thing. I still remember I was in year eight in the locker room, and the boy next to me in the locker room was being bullied by some other guys. And I knew what to do. I knew what it meant to be a good man. What do you do when the person next to you is being bullied? You stand up for them, you do something, you intervene, right? That was the moment my shoes became so fascinating, I could not take my eyes off them. I just sort of moved them this way, I kind of moved them this way. I could not look up, because I was scared. I was scared that if I intervened and I did the right thing, they would come after me. So I did the wrong thing. And what I want my son to know is it cost me. I was ashamed of myself. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror quite the same way again. So this is the kind of argument I think we want to bring to men. This is the kind of conversation that we have to have between men and boys about the cost to us for betraying our own values in the name of proving our masculinity to others. And fortunately here, I think we have an enormous amount of help. Because this is some, one, of, one of the arguments, it seems to me, that the women's movement has been making for the past 40 or 50 years is men are already knowing, we already know how to have those kinds of relationships. We already know what it means. Every man in this room already knows what it means to love a woman and want her to thrive. Because we're not just men. We're not just men. We are fathers. We are sons, we are grandfathers and grandsons, we are brothers and lovers and partners and friends and husbands. We all know what that feels like already. We already know what it feels like. So we're not asking men to do something dramatically different. We're thinking this is a way for men to do, to, to do what we're already doing. You wanna meet an instant feminist? Talk to a man whose daughter just hit puberty. And he is going to say to you, oh my God, there are boys out there who are looking at my daughter the way I was taught to look at women. This has got to stop. <laughs> this has got to stop today. Headline in The Onion recently, 
sort of illustrates this. Eminem terrified as daughter begins dating man raised on his music. <laughs> right? You, he's finally reading his own lyrics, but through a different lens. You want to meet another instant, instant male feminist? Talk to an older man whose, whose grown daughter is facing discrimination in the workplace. And he will say, wow, that workplace has got to change right now. I had no idea. So my feeling is we already know the answer to this. We already know what it feels like to support women, to love women, to want them to succeed. So I think in some ways, you have this, we have this phrase in, in our cultures, um, you know how like we say, oh, you can talk the talk, but you, can't, you, you're not, you have to walk the walk? I think we have to go one step further than walking the walk. I think we have to talk our walk. I think we have to say publicly that this is who we are, that we love women, we care about them because, the women, because we feel that way about the women in our lives. So this, it seems to me, is the place where we begin that conversation. Where the conversation is about masculinity, what we think it means to be a man. And the, and the, the really interesting and probably most hopeful thing I could say is that we are not asking men to be different or to change. We're asking us to remember. We are asking men, in fact, not to be different, but to be more authentically ourselves. Thank you.